Hello, everyone, and welcome to Slash Film Daily for Thursday, March 7th, 2019. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the latest film and TV news. This is Slash Film Editor-in-Chief Peter Serretta, and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Managing Editor Jacob Hall. Hello, hello. And writer Chris Evangelista. Hello. Jacob, you're getting ready for South By, which starts tomorrow? Uh, yes, uh, we'll be. Uh, I'll be seeing the world premiere of Jordan Peele's Us tomorrow, so look forward to a some coverage about that movie. Uh, hopefully an interview with Jordan Peele, fingers crossed, and some reactions on the podcast uh, probably on Monday. That would be very cool. Um, we Yesterday we did a mailbag episode because we really didn't have enough news to talk about. This Today we have more stories than I think we've had ever on the podcast. So this is probably going to be an extra, uh, you know, a supersized edition of the podcast. So let's just dive in. This morning there was a Disney earnings call and during that, or not earnings called uh, investors meeting. And during that investors meeting, they finally revealed when we're going to be able to visit Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. What do we know, Jacob? Well, what we know is that they're actually going to hit the date set. They, I think, people were rumored very early on uh, for Disneyland in California, May 31st, 2019. That is two months from now. And in Walt Disney World, specifically the Hollywood Studios Park, August 29th, 2019, just a few months later. I know that uh, we've heard that construction is still very, very heavy in those areas. So I think you and I both, Peter, were very, very surprised. Yeah, even, by these- even when I had uh, Jermaine on this podcast who visited Galaxy's Edge uh, two weeks ago, I guess now at this point, he was telling me he didn't think that at, – at, at that point, we thought they were opening Galaxy's Edge at the end of June. That's like when – the schedule, if you look at the blackout, uh, blackout dates, that's what it looked like was going to be the plan. And he was telling me he didn't think, you know, walking that that area, he didn't think that they were going to be ready to open by, you know, the end of June. So the end, an end of May opening is is really shocking. Yeah, I'm equally surprised by the Disney World uh, with with August because. If you look at the construction photos that people have been sneaking from the top of roller coasters and with drones and things, that looks like a big dirt pit still with a lot of like shells going on. I am, I don't know what, what this is going to do. They have to crack the whip, I guess. But what's interesting about this and what kind of the uh, bad side to these dates is that one of the two rides will not be ready in time for the opening. I mean, Smuggler's Run, the Millennium Falcon motion simulator, that will be ready. That will open with Galaxy's Edge. But Rise of the Resistance, the dark ride through a first order star destroyer with dozens of animatronics and special effects and quite possibly the most advanced theme park ride of all time from what we've heard will not open at opening date and this means that people who may be complaining vacations around this you know only get one ride instead of two and i guess part of me is thinking well if they need more time to get it right you know it's better to have that great opening with the ride running perfectly than having you know it break constantly on day one and have that bad first impression <laughs> But I'm just thinking of the thousands of people who who that line queue would have soaked up, who are now going to be forced out into the actual land, yeah. and will now be clogging up the restaurants, clogging up the lines for Smuggler's Run, clogging up the shops. I mean, Disneyland even has a reservation system to keep this from getting too overcrowded for its first month. But Peter, if I was in Park Ops, I'd be <laughs> freaking out right now. I think they've been freaking out for the last year, and this is like making things worse. I I think. From what I understand, it was either delaying the opening of this whole park or opening, you know, half cocked. And it sounds like that's what they uh, decided to do with uh, only one of the rides. Um, It's and even getting in there is going to be hard. Uh, They haven't really revealed how the reservation system is going to work. They did say that if you buy, I think, uh, reservations to the Disneyland, uh, the actual official hotels there that those guests will get priority to the reservations. So uh, when I woke up this morning, Jacob, I, I spent 30 minutes trying to get a hotel, and I got a hotel. So I'm going to be there for uh, the opening day, hopefully. And I, I know this won't impact a lot of people. Uh, a lot of People who are going to go to Star Wars Land are going to go to Star Wars Land. But I was strongly considering, like a few months ago, man, maybe I should crash on Peter's couch and go, go to <laughs> Star Wars Land. Uh, but now I'm thinking, I'll just wait till Rise of Resistance opens. I don't want to... I'll, I'll wait till the crowd is die down, and I'll wait until uh, res- the other ride is ready. I feel well, like... Well, you already have on your, your calendar a trip to Orlando to go to Universal, right? 
uh, yeah, I have a universal only trip planned for next year. I got it was either a really really nice universal trip, or a cheapskates universal and Disney trip. <laughs> so I'm just doing universal next year. <laughs> I was gonna say, why not take one of those days and just take a you know Uber down to uh, to uh, Hollywood Studios? Man, I, I may have to. I may have to. Okay. Well, uh, we're both excited about this. Uh, l- l- let's move on to a story that broke yesterday, and that is that Suicide Squad 2 has found a replacement for Will Smith as Deadshot. Chris, what do we know? Uh, that replacement is uh, Idris Elba, who uh, hopefully is going to be in a good movie for once. He's a really good actor. He's you know He's been on The Wire. He's on the show Luther. He's, I, I've always enjoyed his acting, but... He has somehow uh, only been in really subpar movies or very wasted in in other movies. And uh, now he's stepping into this role that was previously played by Will Smith. Um, according to the report, this uh, this was um, he was James Gunn's one and only choice to take over the role of Deadshot. So uh, it's kind of interesting because I'll, I'll, as we'll, as we'll get to soon, a lot of other characters are not returning, but they really want Deadshot in this movie, and rather than just cut him entirely, they're they're going to recast. Now, if you said to me it, you you need to replace Will Smith in a movie, I don't think Idris Elba would be like in the top twenty people on that list of like people I'd come up with. Like, I feel like, I mean, he does have a uh, a charisma about him, but it's it's a totally different thing, right? Yeah, it's a lot. He's, I mean, he can be funny, I guess, but Will Smith is a lot more comedic, I would say. And uh, Idris Elba isn't really overly funny, although, you know, he can do really dry humor. He was on uh, a few episodes of The Office, I remember, and he was very funny on that, doing this very dry, deadpan humor. But yeah, it's it's definitely a much different energy than Will Smith has. Yeah. James Gunn's always had some interesting casting choices. I mean, even looking back at Guardians of the Galaxy now, it looks obvious. But, you know, casting a pro wrestler as Drax was kind of way out of the norm at that point in time. Um, I Another story broke today right before we were going to record this podcast that uh, revealing some of the characters that were going to be in uh, this sequel or reboot or whatever you want to call it. And wh- when the news broke, Chris, you said to me. Is this true? Like, could this be possible that P- Polka Dot Man is actually in this movie? And I said to you, Chris, I said, well, in James Gunn's last movie, he did have Taser Face. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So tell us about the new characters that are going to be in this film. Uh, yeah. So these are super obscure characters here. Um, and, you know, in fairness, the first film had a few obscure characters, too. But these are seem even extra obscure. So the first one is King Shark, which is the only one of these characters I've actually heard of. I think he was on one of the CW shows as a character too, but he is literally what his name suggests. He's a humanoid shark. (laughs) Uh, Then there's Polka Dot Man who wears a costume covered with polka dots and the polka dots can be turned into weapons. It also vehicles i don't know how that works i don't know how his costume could turn into a vehicle but that's what the official uh dc wikipedia said uh another character is peacemaker who is a um peace agent who is so into peace he's willing to kill for it which kind of makes him sound a little bit like um judge dread that you know he's he's the law but he's He's so into the law, he's willing to take the law into his own hands and kill people. And then another character is Rat Catcher, who can control rats. And interestingly enough, the character in the comics is male, but the report says they're going to um, flip the gender and make Rat Catcher a a a woman for the movie. Now, Jacob, you read more comics in probably a week than both Chris and I have probably read in a year. Do you have any experience with any of these characters? Oh goodness! Other than King Shark, who's been a Suicide Squad staple in the comics for you know quite some time, these other three are almost completely new to me. I have almost no opinion on them or thought on them because I feel like James Gunn like challenged himself to find the most obscure DC villain as possible and make them work. I mean, he made Rocket and Groot and Star Lord into you know sensations, characters who ten years ago nobody knew who they were. So I wonder if he's trying to top that because these characters even like i said there are people out there who know comics far more than i do but i know far more than the average person i'd wager these guys are just completely obscure to me i am 
this is these are some deep cuts. These are some, and yeah. I think James Gunn has his work cut out for them selling these characters. But you know what? All power to him. I think he can make it work. I mean, I remember when Guardians was in development, and even before James Gunn came on and signed on to that project. I remember a lot of people were talking like, you know, how do you sell that movie? Like now it seems so obvious. Like, you know, Guardians is such a hit and those characters, there's uh, such a piece of pop culture. But at the time it was like, there's like a walking tree and a talking raccoon. And like, how are they going to, you know, make this a movie like, you know, a movie that's going to be seen by mass audiences. Um, and the same thing seems like the case here. Like I don't, picture my picturing myself liking polka dot man but who knows i mean i have t-shirts with rocket and groot on them now and uh maybe in two years from now because of james gunn i'll have a, a polka dot man t-shirt and king shark who knows um okay let's move on to the next story because we got a lot to get to and that is that they are making a gundam live action movie being penned by why the last man writer and creator brian k vaughn jacob what do we know well, we knew a live-action Gundam movie was coming as of last year, I believe, and we knew it was going to be a co-production between uh, Legendary, the company behind a lot of big franchise movies, and Sunrise, the Japanese animation studio that created Gundam back in the 70s. And But this Brian K. Vaughn news is new, and it's very interesting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Brian K. Vaughn is a, a celebrated comic book writer. He uh, wrote and created Why the Last Man, Ex Machina, Marvel's Runaways, uh, Saga, Paper Girls. He's won multiple Eisner Awards, the uh, the Oscars of the comic book industry. And he worked as a producer and writer on Lost, and he was showrunner on Under the Dome. So even though his uh, comic book work is maybe a bit more impressive than his TV work, he is a very talented, very creative guy. And pairing with Gundam, and if even if you're not an anime fan, I think you've heard of Gundam, Giant Robot. Yeah, what, what is Gundam? Because the only thing I know of Gundam really is it uh, the appearance of Gundam in Ready Player One. It's kind okay, of a... uh, I am no Gundam expert. I I've, I watched Gundam Wing when it, when it played on Cartoon Network back in the day. Uh, but the basics of Gundam is that it, it tracks the wars between you know forces of Earth and the forces of colonies in space. They all pilot giant robots called Gundams. And... The uh, the basic central thesis of, of Gundam is, look at these awesome robots fight, look how cool these weapons of war is, but also at the same time, war is bad, why are we dying, This is death is terrible, why should we harm each other? So it's a very, very tricky balance to have this rad robot fighting robot uh, anime and manga that's also an anti-war story. I feel like it's a really good balancing act for, for Vaughn, who's really been known to balance you know, comedy, drama, horror, science fiction, fantasy really well. And Gundam's always changing. Gundam was originally an anime in the 70s, but it spawned video games and comics and novels and everything you could possibly imagine. It is one of the biggest entertainment exports to ever come out of Japan. And so picking a place to start with Gundam is nearly impossible, but it also means that uh, Vaughn and Legendary and Sunrise have 40 years of history to, to pick and choose from for the absolute best anti-war badass robot stories they want to tell. Are you excited for this? Um, I love Vaughn. I am not familiar enough with Gundam to say I'm super excited. Like I said, my, my, my experience is through the one series that uh, Toonami on Cartoon Network used to play after Dragon Ball Z back in the day. Uh, I have, I've been meaning to do some research. I've been getting in, in more manga recently and trying to, you know, Embrace it the same way I've embraced American comics, and, I, and and so far so good. I actually have picked up um, some Gundam uh, manga that's actually an adaptation of the original uh, anime series, only from a few years ago. So I think it may be a good entry point. You know, a retelling of the com uh, the retelling of the original animated series by modern day um, manga artists seems like a good way to get my toes in there. <laughs> so I'll look into that and let you guys know in a few weeks when I get around to reading it, and I'll let, I'll give you an update if. Gundam is something that we who do not know anything about it should be excited about. The thing that seems promising to me is that it isn't like, you know, these robots fighting, you know, monsters from another dimension or something. It's it's a, it seems like it's more a story based in human like struggles. Oh, yeah, very much. Each Gundam is powered by a human. So when you kill a Gundam, you kill a person. And <laughs> I mean, it's lots of like I said my, my biggest memories of Gundam Wing uh, are. A robot fighting a robot in the most badass battle imaginable, a giant explosion, and the guy leaving the robot and crying because he's so sad about war. 
Those are my biggest <laughs> memories of Gundam. <laughs> okay, let's move on to Movie Pass. We haven't talked about them in a while. Uh, they are apparently changing their business model yet again. What is this, like the 10th or 11th time at this point? Uh, they're now going to focus on their own original films. Chris, is Movie Pass trying to become the next Netflix? That's that's really what it sounds like here. So they're not getting rid of their subscription service, but what they're going to do is devote a lot more energy towards their original movies and then keep the subscription service so you can use that to go see those movies. It's basically like if Netflix only released things to theaters and your Netflix membership got you into the theater to see those movies. That's what this is like, basically. But, but, but instead, this gets you in to see Gaudi. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Like The difference here is people seem to like the Netflix originals, whereas so far the the movie pass originals have been hit or miss, and the the films they have lined up don't really sound that exciting either. Like they have a Bruce Willis movie lined up. Um, they have some movie with Al Pacino in it, which might be good because he's a good actor, but who who knows? So uh, they're really going to have to step up their game, and maybe that's what this is all about. That you know they're announcing they're going to focus more on their films because they want to step up their game and start making better movies. And in theory, this could work if they ended up making, you know, buzzworthy movies, movies that people are really excited about. I could see people, more people signing up for movie pass. So they could go see these movies for free or, you know, part of their membership. But uh, that just seems like it's a long way in the future. Yeah. But how, how many movies a year are they going to release? Do you have any idea? No, that was not uh, announced, but uh, I mean, you know, obviously Netflix, they put out, what, like 70 more than that movies a year? Maybe Movie Pass can get to that point. Who knows? <laughs> I think you're being a little bit optimistic here. I'm, try- I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying to give Movie Pass. <laughs> They've been through a lot. Yeah. I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, in other news, the, the parent company of Movie Pass, I, I heard their stock actually went up, and it's actually just over a penny per, per stock. And I'm not even joking. That's like, uh, that's good news for them. <laughs> That the stock I think that was like once twenty dollars is now a penny. Well, um, see now now is everyone's chance to buy in now and then a year from yeah. now we're all going to be rich when Movie Pass is a, a hit again. Okay, let's move on to Game of Thrones. Let's talk about Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Jacob, how involved is he in this final season of the of the show? Apparently very little. Uh, speaking of him weekly, he revealed that he hasn't even read the scripts for the final season, which is a uh, big step down considering he wrote scripts for the first few seasons. And he's always been, you know, a very close advisor to the showrunners and has been very supportive of it because it's, it's, it's made his books into much bigger bestsellers and made him a very rich man. Uh, but he says that he has not read the scripts because he's currently trying to finish the sixth book in the series, The Winds of Winter which he's been working on since 2011, which is the year the show began. So here's his uh, initial quote. I haven't read the final season scripts and haven't been able to visit the set because I've been working on wins. I know some of the things, but there's a lot of minor character arcs that have been coming up with on their own. And of course, they passed me several years ago. There may be important discrepancies. Uh, what he's talking about here is how they passed the events of his most recent book, the the fifth book, uh, about three seasons ago. So they've been kind of making up as they went along with only a loose outline of his overall plan. So, and fans of the show have already known all this, but I think it's very interesting that things have reversed. Rather than George R. R. Martin being the keeper of secrets, the show is now the keeper of secrets from the man who created the world in which the show is set. And uh, Dave Benioff, one of the showrunners and creators of, the, of HBO's Game of Thrones, uh, talked about how they're not going to do any interviews or talk about how the end of the show differs from what George R. R. Martin told about his ending because they don't want to spoil the books. So they're, they're going <laughs> to go out of their way to, um, uh, even though there will be some crossover, there'll be enough differences that they're not going to say what is show based and what is book based to make sure people can still read the books and not be spoiled. This may be the weirdest spoiler territory we've ever seen, Peter, where a TV show is spoiling an ongoing series of books that's based on. It is, it's wild to think about. That is so strange. Do we know how different the ending of the book is going to be from the show? I guess they're uh, not talking about it, right? Yeah, we don't know for sure because, you know, there's still 2,000-page books left in the series, and it's impossible to say where we're going. But when we last left off in the books, the characters were in such different places. People who were alive are now dead. People who were dead are now alive. Uh, characters who are incredibly important in the books never existed in the show. So – 
I think I think we may be seeing a very similar broad trajectory, but the details are going to be very different. And I think we're going to be seeing some very very different stuff in the in the in the final stretch. And I think George R. R. Martin may even go out of his way to change some things to make sure people who know the show by heart will see some surprises on the page. Okay, let's move over to the DCEU. Uh, they, you know, they are making a Aquaman spinoff, The Trench, which we all assumed was going to be a prequel, uh, you know, showing us how The Trench came to be. But it turns out that might not be the case after all. Chris, tell us about it. Uh, yeah, when when the trench uh, spinoff was announced, it, it was all you know. It, it wasn't made official that it would be a prequel, but everyone just assumed it would be the, a prequel because in Aquaman, it's revealed that the trench were once Atlanteans and then they you know mutated and became these uh, hideous monsters that don't talk. And the, you know the the question was, how do you make a movie about that? Well, maybe you make it about how those Atlanteans turned into the trench, but. That is not the case. Um, Peter Safran, who is the producer of Aquaman and is going to be the producer of The Trench, said it's not going to be a prequel. It's actually a film that takes place after the events of Aquaman. And he also said, we're going to see the movie a lot sooner than Aquaman 2. Aquaman 2 is due out in 2022. So you can expect The Trench a lot sooner, according to him. We don't know when exactly, but uh, he, he made it sound like it's going to be significantly sooner. So maybe... Maybe next year. Who who knows? Well, I guess you could just hide. You know, there's so much CG and so many visual effects that are required for Aquaman. But this, you can have like a lot of it in the darkness and kind of like uh, be at atmospheric, I guess, a little bit. Um, Jacob, do you have any ideas of what they could be doing with the trench? Well, the trench are actually a very recent addition to the DC universe. They were created in 2011 when uh, DC relaunched its comics line as New 52 and tried to reinvent itself for a few years. I remember this vividly because it was the very first Aquaman comic I ever actually bought and read, written by Jeff Johns, and it's when The Trench was introduced. And it was actually a very, very small, low-key horror story about abductions and murders along the coasts of, of New England, Aquaman investigating and learning that there's these monsters rising from the deep attacking small communities, and that was the introduction of The Trench, these, these monsters, and it was this... Um, Aquaman goes monster hunting, and it was very creepy and very scary. And I actually thought for a long time, if they ever wanted to make an Aquaman movie, it would be a really good, you know, medium budget approach uh, to that uh, to, to to make a movie like that. They went the opposite direction and went full Lord of the Rings. But I do think that basic comic minus Aquaman, that arc could be a good foundation here. You know, we, I, you have a DC character, super, super powered or not, investigating a series of murders. And suddenly you have monsters attacking from Atlantis or Atlantis adjacent kingdom. And, you know, I don't I don't remember where the comic went. I don't remember how it ended. The trench was not defeated by, you know, they're still around. Uh, but there is there's material out there collected in uh, Jeff Johns's first Aquaman arc. If you want to go track it down, maybe get an idea of what could happen. And it taking place after Aquaman. Like, I don't even understand what the. What the idea of that being like? How would that affect the trench? Um, maybe uh, Aquaman uh, invading their kingdom has displaced them. They are ah. they're they're off swimming to the new waters, trying to find a safer home, and they settle upon somewhere where they become a problem. Yeah, uh, we talked a bit earlier about this uh, Disney uh, Disney investors uh, meeting that they had. And during that investors meeting, they actually revealed that Disney Plus will house the entire Disney motion picture library, including things from the Disney vault. Chris, what do we know? Uh, yeah, during at the end of the shareholders meeting, there was a Q&A session and Bob Iger uh, just casually tossed this off. He really didn't make a big deal out of it, even though it sounds like a big deal. But he revealed that Disney Plus, the, the upcoming Disney streaming service, will eventually have the entire Disney motion picture library and the Disney Vault. And if you don't know what the Disney Vault is, um, Disney, uh, in a clever marketing strategy, they only release their movies on home video, or in this case, in this day and age, digital, for a certain period of time. And then they pull it away, and it's not available for years. And then when they, they re release it again, so everyone will quickly buy it again. But yeah, like, like one of my friends yesterday was complaining that he wanted to show his kid Cinderella, and it's not available anywhere on digital right now. 
Yeah, it's nuts. And I mean, it's nuts for us. It's a great business strategy for them. But uh, according to this, it's going to all be available soon on Disney Plus. But there are a lot of questions like this. Uh, the first thing that came up in our Slack channel was, you know, is if is he serious about every Disney movie being on there? Like, is, you know, the very controversial Song of the South going to be available on there? I can't imagine that happening. But he literally said every single movie. See, I feel like with Song of the South, what you need to do is you need to get, like, Leonard Maltin, ha- provide, like, a, you know, 15-minute intro, providing historical context and and talking about the controversy. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would be needed. Like, you can't just yeah. have the movie on there, like, you know, click I, on the movie yeah. and play. Yeah, I agree. There is a way to show it with, you know, that historical context if they do it that way. So maybe you're right. Maybe they would do something like that. Who knows? Yeah, um, I pretty much assumed that the vault was going to be on there. I'm just wondering how big, uh, like how much content is going to be on there. Because I think he said like the motion picture library, but they have so many shorts. They have so many like TV specials, all those like Disneyland specials. I used to collect those um, on DVD. They used to have these like tin of like these, I forgot what they were called, uh, Walt Disney, they're like these tins of like these old like Disneyland specials and stuff. And like actually most DVDs are worth like nothing today. But if you want to sell one of those tins, like they're still worth like some of them are worth like hundreds of dollars because they were such limited edition. So I'm wondering if that material is going to be available in, in Disney Plus. Uh, Jacob, is there anything in particular you want to see from the vault? I mean, I want to see all the super old shorts in the twenties, all the up ear work stuff uh, from, you know, uh, from back when Disney was still learning his craft and it was like, and, and they real- acquired all that stuff, right? Yeah, I believe I believe they have, and it like this early Disney stuff is weird, and it, it's from before Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck became mascots, and they were allowed to like be full fledged characters in, in a way that's often very surprising. And they're, those old shorts are weird, and they're funny, and they're. Uh, they're often surreal, and by the 40s and 50s, by the time color came around, uh, Mickey was drained of personality, and he stopped being you know this mischievous uh, heroic character that we see in the original shorts. So lot, even though, and even though to Disney's credit, the newest Mickey Mouse shorts have done a great job of making um, Mickey a character again, but there is you know 15 years of incredible animated shorts that are sometimes very scary, sometimes very funny, sometimes just plain weird. That like should be available for study. I, it, it, it just in a, in a historical context. I, I think it's important for Disney to have its legacy and its history on this service. I want to see those. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. for that too. Uh, let's move on to our final story, and that is uh, during this investors conference, they actually showed footage of a bunch of uh, upcoming movies, including Star Wars, Toy Story Four, Lion King. Uh, in Avengers Endgame, uh, we we will. I'll, I'll provide the link to the Star Wars footage. You can you can find out what was in that on slashfilm dot com. That link will be in the show notes. But I did want to talk about this Avengers Endgame footage that they showed because this kind of does set us up for what happens at the beginning of that movie. So if if you don't want to know, tune out now because I guess there's uh, some you know minor spoilers for the opening of Avengers Endgame. So Jacob. What what was screened at this investors meeting? Uh, first of all, all credit to Twitter user Scott Ladowig, who is present and provided most of these details. So thank you very much, Scott. <laughs> Probably not listening to this, but thank you. And the footage uh, finds uh, our surviving heroes assembled at the Avengers headquarters. Uh, everyone is there minus Iron Man and Ant-Man. Ant-Man, presumed because he's still stuck in the quantum realm. And Iron Man, for reasons unknown, he was impaled <laughs> last time we saw him. Uh, that means uh, uh, Captain America and Thor and Nebula and Rocket Raccoon and surprisingly Captain Marvel are all gathered at Avengers headquarters to talk about what to do next with Thanos. And they're planning a revenge attack. They, they um, think they know where he is. Nebula refers to a place called the Garden, which must be the farm we saw Thanos retire to at End of Infinity War. And they all uh, talk about how, how will this be different? How will we actually beat him this time? And Captain Marvel uh, says that they will have her this time. That's how they'll beat him, which sounds very much in line with the very confident character uh, that we will see in theaters this week. And this actually brings up a, a really good question. Uh, War Machine, James, uh, James Rhodes, uh, straight up asked Captain Marvel, if you're powerful enough to defeat Thanos, where have you been? And she responds by saying, not other planets have a team of Avengers helping them. 
which is actually a really, really good answer. <laughs> because I mean, she's been flying around the universe, saving other planets from catastrophes. And it ends with uh, Thor deciding that he really likes Captain Marvel, which is a something a fun little character moment. And the other uh, quick scene shown has the gathered Avengers all getting on the Benatar, the Guardian spaceship. A rocket is piloting. And he asks everyone, uh, who here has not been to space? And Captain America, Black Widow, and War Machine all raise their hands. And uh, Rocket asks them not to puke. And they take off, presumably to go fight Thanos again. And that's all the footage that was shown. But it sounds like, you know, more of what I liked about Infinity War, which is all these disparate characters in one space bouncing off each other. Yeah, and it sounds like we're going to get this rematch with Thanos maybe earlier than I think most people expected. Because it sounds like it's kind of the opening of this movie, right? Uh, yeah, uh, Disney's uh, Disney and Marvel have said in the past that they're only using advertising footage from the first you know act of this movie, and I don't think that that, that would they would show more than that in a you know in a meeting that's going to be publicly re- uh, reported upon and shared. So I think that this movie's going to have a lot of surprises and a lot of things. It's, it's not going to culminate in hey we're ready to fight Thanos again. I think we're going to see a lot of very very big things happen very early in this movie. Yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be exciting. Anyways, we we have officially gone over our time slots. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's Slash Home Daily. You can find more of all of our work at slashhome.com. Uh, you know, Jacob's gonna be covering South by uh, this coming week, so you know, follow him on Twitter at Jacob S Hall. Uh, that's right. And, uh, yeah, and you'll see his coverage on the site as well. You can find more of all the stories we mentioned today in the show notes and linked on the, uh, you know, on the site. Uh, this podcast, Slash Film Daily, is published every weekday on iTunes, Google, Overcast, Spotify, all the popular podcast apps. Please feel free to send us your feedback, questions, comments, concerns, or life advice to peter at slashfilm.com. We, we do have a bunch of life advice we got to get to, Chris, in the future. So uh, so get ready because we got some hard questions for you. Um, oh, I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready. And uh, <laughs> please go on over to our iTunes page, rate and review this podcast, tell your friends, spread the word. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>